Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to DCR's public meeting for the 2021 forest management proposals. My name is Peter Church. I'm the director of forest stewardship for DCR. Thank you for participating in this virtual public meeting. Your feedback is important to us. This is the second year that we've done these public meetings virtually due to the pandemic. This year we're using the Teams platform, so bear with us if there are any technical glitches or momentary pauses. Uh, the presentation is also being recorded. I want to first introduce Tom Berlay, our State Lands Management Forestry Supervisor. I'll be turning the meeting over to Tom in just a minute, but first want to introduce our technical support team that are behind the scenes to help us with these presentations. Malcolm Itter from UMass is the Assistant Professor of Environmental Conservation and will be our Q&A host during the presentation. Malcolm is an impartial moderator and UMass is not endorsing any views in this presentation. Dan Cushing is DCR's Director of Public Engagement and Mary Cardwell and Bill Van Doren work for the Bureau of Forest Fire Control and Forestry and they're also behind the scenes. At this time, I will pass the presentation on to Tom Berlay. Tom. Well, thank you, Pete, and thanks to everyone for joining in. Tonight, we'll be pre presenting three proposals across the western part of Massachusetts. Uh, prior to that, I have a brief presentation which will outline the protocol for today's time for today's team's live event. So thanks again, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the proposal presentation for the Department of Cons Conservation and Recreation Forest Management Program's 2021 Forest Management Proposals. I am Tom Brule, the new Forest Management Program Supervisor. I have been on board with the program for about four months now. Prior to accepting the program supervisory post, I was a forestry and wildlife consultant in the private sector for a little over 30 years. Today's meeting will run from 4 p.m. till 5.30 p.m. The meeting is being recorded and be made available by Teams Live. To help with logistical issues such as broadband limitations for some viewers, all attendees' video and audio will be turned off. Written questions and comments can be asked by typing in the chat box during the presentation and will be answered. Questions for which we do not have time available will be responded to. If you are unable to chat a question or comment, please send in writing to forestry.comments at mass.gov or call 413-545-3891 and leave a message. In 2012, DCR released the landscape designations for DCR Parks and Forests. This document is used across the department and the forest management program as guidance for all its management activities. It includes land designation units as well as management policy and protocol. As part of the guiding document, DCR policy instructs the forest management program to provide public information meetings to present information and answer questions regarding newly proposed projects. The program views these presentations as not only a beneficial venue for public education, we also view the meetings as an educational opportunity for the program as we learn different perspectives we may not have been made aware of. If there are technical problems with tonight's presentation, please direct your questions directly to the host. And before I forget, I would like to thank Malcolm Itter, Assistant Professor of Forest Conservation at the University of Massachusetts, for hosting the event. Thank you, Malcolm. Forest management proposals are developed annually. The proposals take into consideration the many stewardship goals the program strives to manage. Some of the forest stewardship goals include mitigation and adaptation practices for climate change, wildlife habitat, forest health, fire and public safety, biodiversity, forest products, local economies, and recreation. Once the forest management proposal is made, it goes through an internal review. During this process, comments are received from the Ecology Program, DCR's Cultural Resources Program, as well as Parks and Operations. Parallel with this internal review, there's an external review by the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife 
as well as the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. Once posted, the projects go through a 45-day public comment period. The 45-day comment period for the July 2021 proposals has been extended till August 31st. All of the proposals have been posted on the Bureau of Forestry's Department and Conservation Recreation's website. Again, if you have any specific project questions or comments, you may send them to forestry.comments at mass.gov. Next steps in project development, foresters will begin developing a stand inventory, creating individual stand and area prescriptions. Once developed, the process will move to project layout. Foresters will designate trees and vegetation to be removed, flag all sensitive areas, including wetlands and riparian areas, as well as sensitive cultural sites. Landing areas and major forest roads are laid out in advance to minimize long-term damage while facilitating long-term access. This process includes the development of a Chapter 132 forest cutting plan. These plans are mandatory for both public and private lands for which more than 50 cords or 25,000 board feet of timber are cut in a calendar year. Once the plan is submitted, the project is reviewed by the Service Forestry Program, as well as another review by the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. Once the project is developed and all permits secured, the Forestry Program will continue its public outreach by conducting a pre-management tour. The tourists will help explain to the public the long and short-term stewardship goals for the project. There are six proposals which will be presented. Tuesday's presentations will be those in Western Mass. The project entitled The Old House Project is within the Chester Blanford State Forest presented by forester Chris Massini. Chris will also be presenting a project on the Mount Washington State Forest referred to as the Cattle Barn Project. The final presentation for the evening will be made by forester Keith DiNardo. His presentation will be for the Burnham Road Management Project on the Northfield State Forest. Thursday's presentations will include two from Forester Joel Batur, the Willis Road Project on the Lawton State Forest, as well as the Beeman Pond Project located on the Otter River State Forest. Forester Paul Gregory will present his unique Charge Pond Project located on the Miles Standish State Forest. As a reminder, the 2021 proposals are posted on our website. Project specific comments or questions can be sent to forestry.comments at mass.gov. Below are some useful links to resources which may help you answer some of your questions regarding climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as wildlife habitat management. Thanks to everyone who helped the Forest Management Program with tonight's presentations, and special thanks to all who are attending for your care and concern for the well being of the Commonwealth's forests and all the values they bring us. Well, thank you. The, the first project we're going to hear tonight is from Forrester Chris Massini. His presentation will be on his proposal at the Chester Blanford State Forest entitled The Old House Project. Hello and welcome to the 2021 Department of Conservation and Recreation Bureau of Forestry Forest Management Proposals. My name is Christopher Massini. I am the Management Forester of the Central Berkshire District. In this presentation, I'll be discussing the proposed forest management operation within the Chester Blanford State Forest titled The Old House Lot. This project is located within the woodland zone. The mission of the Bureau of Forestry Management Forestry Program on these lands 
is to provide for ecosystem services and benefits associated with active forest management. The goals and benefits of these forestry projects within the woodland zone include the production of local wood products, water quality improvements, the creation of diverse habitats for wildlife, improved or repaired recreational opportunities, and carbon stock management. The forest management within DCR forest parks and reservations are done with the expectation they will serve as an example of excellent forestry practices to the public. The ecosystem services that state lands provide will be balanced across the landscape and the scale of time where they are deemed appropriate. The old house lot is located within the Chester Blanford State Forest in the southern portion of the main block. It has frontage on Beulah Land Road located in the town of Blanford. This forest management project consists of 106 acres. The main goals of the project include the maintenance of resilient forests, the retention of hemlock, the creation of young forest habitat, the conversion of several Norway spruce plantations, and the repair and restoration of several roads and trails. This project consists of four forest types, the first being hemlock, which is currently under threat of the hemlock woolly adelgid and hemlock looper, two pests which are responsible for killing much of the hemlock within the state forest. The second area is a red maple, poplar, and red pine mixed stand, which is planned to be cut to provide early successional or young forest age classes for wildlife. This will replace areas cut previously for this purpose. The third forest type are Norway spruce plantations, some of which have been cut in the early 2000s and others which have been unmanaged until now. These are in various states of of health and condition. The fourth forest type is oak hemlock, which has been harvested previously, but is lacking um, acceptable regeneration and structural diversity. The Chester Blanford State Forest and this project area in particular have had many disturbances over time, including agricultural and industrial timberland use. Much of this project area was harvested in the early 1920s and then purchased by the state in 1924. Additional acreage was bought in the 1930s. At the time of purchase, most of the cutover areas and abandoned fields were planted to Norway spruce, white pine, and red pine. Since the state acquisition, this area has been actively managed. There have been 15 projects within the state forest since 1980, with the last project occurring nearby in 2016. The Norway spruce plantations within this project area were harvested in the early 2000s. There are several recognized hiking trails outside of the project area. However, there are no official walking trails or recreational trails in the project area. This area is open to hunting during legal seasons.
Goals of this forestry project include maintaining the current hemlock stands by providing adequate, adequate growing conditions for mature trees while also promoting the regeneration of hemlock in the understory. The second goal is to create new young forest habitat to benefit the suite of wildlife species who rely on it. The third major goal is to regenerate red oak and other masked trees. This project hopes to demonstrate harvesting techniques and best management practices that protect the forest productivity, the recreation and aesthetic values, as well as soil and water resources. Next several slides will discuss the silvicultural plan to reach the goals and objectives of this project. Silviculture, in short, is the art and science of controlling uh, the forest to reach the goals and objectives of the landowner. We base our silviculture on scientific information as well as field observations and create a silvicultural prescription for each project. Within the oak hemlock and hemlock hardwood stands, bill regular shelterwood will be applied to maintain a forest with high levels of structural, spatial, and species diversity. Individually, in the oak hemlock stands, we will target for removal of white ash. And we will aim to create conditions to regenerate desired species such as oak, hickory, maple, and birch. We will also try to prevent beech from proliferating within the stand. This is due to the current level of beech bark disease. Within the hemlock hardwood stands, we will thin the overstory hemlocks, retaining healthy dominant trees to provide the best conditions to resist insect damage. We will also try to create favorable conditions to regenerate hemlock so that it will be part of the future forest. Again, in this stand, we will try to prevent beech from becoming a dense understory. Within the aspen, red maple, and red pine stand, there will be a five acre clear cut where at least three to five mature trees per acre will be retained for wildlife seed dispersal and stand structure. These trees may be retained in both groups or as individuals. This harvest is adjacent to previously clear cut stands abutting DCR property and within DCR property. This is to provide early successional habitat. Within the Norway spruce portions of this project area, there are eight acres which have not been treated yet. Here we will conduct the first step of a shelter wood harvest where we will, where we will remove 50 to 70 percent of the stand and allow regeneration to become established. In the remaining four acres, where harvesting occurred in the early 2000s, we will, we will remove the remaining overstory trees, retaining healthy individuals for habitat and releasing the regenerated young forest stand. The desired condition of this project area 
includes having a diversity of tree species, size, density, and age classes within the project area. Also for the successful regeneration and retention of desired species. In the future, there may be possible treatments to expand upon successes. The oak hardwoods may be looked at for treatment again in 20 to 25 years. The remaining Norway spruce stand should be looked at in five to 10 years for successful regeneration and removal of the remaining Norway spruce. The aspen, red maple, red pine stand may be available for treatment again in 30 to 40 years to retain the early successional habitat in this area. All right, thanks, Chris, for that uh, initial presentation on the Old House uh, Lot Project. Um, and so we've got some question and answers coming in, or some questions coming in now on the first presentation. Uh, so we'll move into our first Q&A session. And so um, the first question here has to do with um, the impacts of pests and pathogens uh, in connection or in uh, sort of uh, combination with climate change. And so um, first question here is given that hemlock looper is a native defoliating caterpillar, um, is, it, is it possible that uh, basically as climate change that our forests are expected to see um, more severe impacts of native insects and pathogens uh, in the future? Uh, thanks, Malcolm. That's a really great question. Um, and it's something that we are constantly trying to um, learn about and adjust our, our management as we go. Um, I do think as, as trees become more stressed, even our native uh, insects can certainly begin to do more damage. Part of the, the goal of this project is to give the, uh, the remaining hemlocks within the project area a, a fighting chance, essentially give them more resources, spread them out a little bit so that um, they might be able to withstand um, you know, not only the, uh, the the native looper, but the, um, the invasive hemlock woolly adelgid. So uh, moving forward, uh, it's hopefully we don't continue to have uh, more and more insects that we have to worry about. So on a related note here, um, second question has to do with the impact of hemlock woolly adelgid. So what is the likelihood that Hemlocks could actually survive an impact or attack by hemocoloid adelgid, and on what scientific basis do you do you know this? Um, so there has been um, recommendations through the Forest Service and and other um, research that's been done that does show that healthy hemlock, when when spaced out enough, do have a higher survival ship rate. It doesn't mean that they're going to um, live for good. Um, or that they'll they'll always uh, kind of win the fight against the hemlock woolly adelgid, um, but it's kind of the best fighting chance you can give them. Um, we do uh, in along it, within this forest along Sanderson Brook Falls. There's um, our forest health department does treat some of the hemlocks um, to try and maintain them, but to do that uh, to treat individual trees in the landscape level just isn't possible, and that's that's why we try and um, do this thinning technique to give them as much chance as they can. Uh, so it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. Maybe we should just pause for a second and see um, if we have some additional questions on this project or just general questions about um, the ongoing or proposed uh, management projects. 
We do have about 10 minutes left in this session if people do have additional questions. Uh, so, okay, it looks like we have a question now about um, the public comment period. And so, um, if there is a 45 day public, uh, or excuse me, a 45 days for public comment, um, why is the public comment period ending on the 31st of August um, when we're only hearing when the presentations are occurring this week? So, today is the August 17th. So, Pete, do you want to uh, field that one? Sure, thanks, Malcolm. Um, we've had the um, the projects posted since um, early July, um, our announcement came out a little later, and so um, they have been up for 45 days. If we do get a lot of comments, um, we'll always accept them, but um, we did want to have a deadline. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, so, so we got another question that's sort of specific to uh, the proposed um, management project, and so. Uh, Chris, if you're, um, why are you planning to cut hardwoods in this in this project or this job if you're expecting that the hemlocks may succumb to the hemlock way of Delgin? So the the essentially the whole plan is for a forest type as a whole, and to I guess to ignore the hardwoods. Um, the spacing of, of trees being uh, harvested for for many different reasons kind of you you can't just say we're only gonna space around the hemlocks you might need to cut hardwoods not only give those hemlock spacing um but for other reasons as well the there are hardwoods in so the, the there's several different types there's uh the norway spruce types that we're working in here as well as the uh, um, hemlock and hardwood types where there's not hemlock, we can also do some good by trying to eliminate um, a diseased beach component of the stand and also try and regenerate some desirable hardwoods uh, such as the oak and, and maples and hickories. So it's it's not just treatment of the hemlock um, in those stands. If All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, so the next question is, uh, where is the, the timber that you're going to be removing during this project? Where is that going to go? Um, so that is a, a pretty big question, but can be answered uh, um, shortly. That the typically the wood products that come off of the timber sale are separated into what would be called um, log type products that would be turned into boards or, or lumber. Um, in in this case, softwoods typically get turned into uh, dimensional lumber, building building lumber, and hardwoods typically get turned into uh, things more so like flooring and, and furniture stock. Um, the smaller trees or the um, um, the or you know the the less um, the lower quality uh, logs often get turned into into pallet type material or, or railroad ties. Um, some of the hardwood, the smaller hardwood, will be turned into um, usually get sold as firewood um, and or uh, pulp. And the smaller softwoods is often sold as as pulp as well for uh, for paper use in places. The exact location of where the wood goes, um, if if that's what the person is asking, um, many of our local sawmills. Um, there are still some local sawmills around, and and if they were to be the winning um, bid for the project, um, most you know the wood would go there. Other times, wood is shipped um, out of state to to bigger sawmills and to to pulp and paper mills. Um, most of the firewood that I've seen cut on our projects typically does stay, um, usually within a town or two, of of the harvest area. Uh, so hopefully, I answered answered that without going too far. Of course. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so there was a quick question. Uh, just to reiterate, we're we're currently talking about uh, projects that's proposed within Blanford State Forest uh, within the old house lot. 
so there seems to be some question about an upcoming project in Northfield, and so we'll do uh, questions and answers um, for each of these projects following their presentation. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, Uh, so there's a comment here about um, thinning practices, and so um, from John Scanlon, the thinning of hemlock to enhance resistance to the hemlock wave elder, is, is this analogous to thinning of pitch pine in eastern Massachusetts pine barrens in order to enhance the resistance of, to southern pine beetle? Um, so Chris, can you field that one? Um. Certainly, hemlock um, has tremendous wildlife value. Um, they, they, essentially, the, the thermal cover that that a healthy hemlock stand can provide um, for shade in the forest is is excellent. Um, so that's true. And um, I'm sorry, what was the the second part? I was uh, I was trying to read some of these other comments. Uh, just something about it, it basically the, the similarities between thinning for resistance to hemlock delgid and thinning in pine barrens in eastern Massachusetts to deal with the southern pine beetle. Yes, yeah, so certainly. You're just, by thinning, you're just uh, like I mentioned earlier. You're just uh, really trying to give the trees their best best chance to be healthy and and survive uh, enough light resources and um, the the keep the when the branches are touching. That's a an easy way for the delgid to spread as well as um, you know, birds can spread things, so the it's really just giving it the best chance to stay healthy. Uh, so there seems to be again a, an additional question on the Northfield um, proposed Northfield project. So Tom, do you want to just let people know? Um, again, currently we're talking about a proposed project within Blandford State Forest. Tom, can you just let folks know where they can find um, information about these uh, cutting plans? Yeah, these are. Thank you, Malcolm. These are just proposals right now. We're, we're currently discussing the Chester Blandford Forest Project. The next project we will be discussing and presenting is going to be the Cattle Barn Project, which is on the Mount Washington State Forest. And the final presentation of the afternoon is going to be the, uh, the Northfield State Forest, the uh, Burnham Road Project. Okay. Um, so there is one additional question. Uh, we've got a Dan, do we have enough time to field this last question or should we move on? We can field this last question. Okay. And, uh, and we'll All go right. to it. So this will be the last uh, last question in this session. Um, and so um, for Chris, do you prioritize retaining the largest trees uh, for their value and storing carbon? Yep. So um, the I guess one of the uh, better things about the the process of trying to help these hemlocks is we are keeping the the biggest and healthiest trees, and absolutely a, a great I guess side benefit to that is uh, you're storing a lot of carbon in them. Um, the on the opposite side, uh, some of the the lower quality trees that might not survive very long. Um, if they can be turned into some kind of a more permanent product and then be replaced with faster growing trees, uh, you, you, you get that carbon benefit as well by um, by the long term storage and uh, then fast. Um, fast growing trees uh, taking carbon back out of the atmosphere. So um, yeah, I, I, it is part of uh, it's part of the part of the thought process, I guess is the best way to answer it. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, so with that, we'll end this first Q&A session. And again, we'll have some additional time for, for discussion and, and questions following the other presentations. Uh, but we'll turn things over, uh, turn things back over to Tom uh, to set up the next presentation. OK, well, thank you, Malcolm. The next presentation we're going to hear is another um, proposal by Forester Chris Messini. It is in South Berkshire County on the Mount Washington State Forest, and it is uh, referred to as the Cattle Barn Project. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Management Forestry Proposals presentation. 
I am Christopher Mussini, Management Forester for the Central Berkshire District. This project is located in the South Berkshire Forestry District within the Mount Washington State Forest Interman Lot. The title of this project is the Cattle Barn Lot. This project is located within the woodland zone. The mission of the Bureau of Forestry Management Forestry Program on these lands is to provide for ecosystem services and benefits associated with active forest management. The goals and benefits of these forestry projects within the woodland zone include the production of local wood products, water quality improvements, the creation of diverse habitats for wildlife, improved or repaired recreational opportunities, and carbon stock management. The forest management within DCR forest parks and reservations are done with the expectation they will serve as an example of excellent forestry practices to the public. The ecosystem services that state lands provide will be balanced across the landscape and the scale of time where they are deemed appropriate. This project is within the Interman lot of the Mount Washington State Forest, located in the northern portion of the town of Mount Washington, with frontage along East Street and Mount Washington Road. This project covers an area of 362 acres of woodlands. Major goals of the project include maintenance of resilient forests, the salvage and pre-salvage of white ash, plantation conversion, invasive species control, field restoration and maintenance, and road and trail erosion mitigation. This portion of the state forest has had long histories of agricultural and timber uses. Much of these lands were abandoned agricultural lands used for both crop and pasture. There was also a great deal of active management by the previous owners. The state acquired this parcel in 1958 to 1959. Since then, the state has actively managed portions of this property, with the last project being completed in 1988. The state has also maintained the fields and has utilized this parcel for passive recreation. Some of the conditions which led to this project's development include the arrival of emerald ash borer, which has begun to cause damage and mortality to the white ash trees within this project. There are also two small trees, one of large and one of no, which are in decline due to stresses such as forest pests and overcrowding. The desire to reclaim portions and clear the edges of the hay fields is part of this project as well, as is the desire to try and control the invasive species which are overtaking portions of the project area. These include multiflora rose and Japanese barberry. Some of the goals associated with this project include demonstrating harvesting techniques and best management practices that protect forest productivity, as well as the recreational and aesthetic values, soil and water resources. 
we will remove and salvage the white ash prior to mortality by directing the residual stands to a more uneven aged condition and promoting oak, hickory, maple, and birch species while preventing beech proliferation. Within the plantations, the goal will be to convert these to northern hardwoods through a shelterwood harvest. Within the fields, our goal is to reclaim lost acres due to staff and maintenance shortages over the years, as well as clearing the field edges and stone walls to create easier maintenance regimes. We'll capture the monetary value of diseased trees, treat the invasive species, and improve public safety along the town roads. The next several slides will discuss the silvicultural plan to reach the goals and objectives of this project. Silviculture, in short, is the art and science of controlling uh, the forest to reach the goals and objectives of the landowner. We base our silviculture on scientific information as well as field observations and create a silvicultural prescription for each project. Silviculture within the northern hardwood stands will consist of single tree and group selection. This practice aid in targeting white ash for removal as a priority, maintain a forest with high levels of structural, spatial, and species diversity, and will create the conditions to regenerate desired species such as oak, hickory, maple, birch. There will be varied opening sizes up to one third of an acre. Within the larch and Norway spruce plantations, the silvicultural practice prescribed will be shelter woods. This will aid in the conversion of these acres into northern hardwoods. It will consist of a two-step process with first removing 50 to 70 percent of the current stand to allow regeneration to form. In five to ten years, a second harvest should occur to remove most of the remaining overstory trees, retaining healthy individuals for habitat, and releasing the new forest underneath. There are several desired conditions associated with this project area. Within the northern hardwood stands, the goal is to have a diversity of tree species, sizes, density, and age. This area may be evaluated for further treatment to expand upon successes in 25 years. Within the plantations, the desired condition is to have successful regeneration and retention of desired species in the understory. If this occurs, the second step of removing the remaining overstory may occur in five to 10 years. Within the maintained fields, our desired condition is the ability to maintain the full extent of these fields. Planning future mowings around seasonal benchmarks, potentially finding a vendor for an agricultural permit to harvest this hay, and potential maintenance with fire are all possibilities into the future to reduce the burden of maintenance on DCR. The control of invasive species to facilitate the regeneration within the northern hardwoods 
implantations is a goal. Also, reducing the risk of hazard trees along the road to help the town bear the burden of this maintenance. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, so again, just for folks who potentially joined during the middle of that uh, presentation, uh, we're currently discussing um, this proposed project within the cattle barn lot, uh, which is within Mount Washington State Forest. Uh, and so our first question here relates to uh, ash mortality within this area. And so um, if the if DCR were to take a, a passive management approach to ash mortality, so no management there, um, what vegetation would you expect to fill the that niche or that opening caused by that ash mortality? Um, and looking at, at this over um, time spans of a short time span of 15 years, a longer time span of 50 years, and then up to even 100 years. Um, and is that conclusion or your expectation, is that derived from the vegetation that's already present in the understory and the midstory within this forest? Um, and also what steps um, must forest management take to try to establish a desirable species mix in the face of this expected ash mortality. So Chris, do you, uh, can you feel that one? Uh, maybe there's some technical difficulties with Chris. Uh, Tom, are you able to feel that question? Yeah, with regards to the ash mortality, if, yes. if we do, yes, absolutely. If we do nothing, we do know that there will be a, an opening in the canopy. So initially what could, could come in are invasive species. When you do partial cuttings like that, species that would probably come in will be species like beech, red maple, potentially hemlock and black birch. Those species will mo more than likely fill the void. All right, and then uh, can you address the second question which relates to what management steps need to be taken in order to ensure uh, a healthy mixture of species in the face of this expected ash mortality? Could you say that again, Malcolm? I couldn't quite hear it. Sure. So the question is related to what specific steps we need to be taking from a forest, ma forest management perspective to ensure a healthy mixture um, in terms of species composition in the face of this expected ash mortality. Well, several different approaches can be taken. Um, if we want to create more diversity, heavier cutting will allow for species such as black cherry, uh, sugar maple. And if we leave enough ash, you could even get some ash back but certainly white pine and also red oak would also come in, especially in South Berkshire County. All right, All right thanks, Tom. Uh, so the second question here uh, is related to this project specifically. And so how many field acres will be reclaimed um, within this project? And have you considered allowing those acres to mature now? Uh, yeah, think, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Malcolm, a little bit less than 10 acres we're going to try to reclaim, mostly from dying or dead um, plantations. Okay, uh, and then I think sort of, sort of related to that first question, what methods are you using to control for, um, or, or excuse me, what methods are, we, are you using um, as part of your invasive species management? Invasive species management, well, they'll, be tr they'll be treated with herbicides. Most likely a glyphosate. Glyphosate, excuse me. Okay, and that's within this project, but also on a sort of general level, or that's just this project specifically. This is mostly just project specific. In general, we we tend to use chemical. It's a lot more cost effective to use herbicides. Okay. All right, so. 
got still a little bit more time for some questions. Um, so we've got a question coming in. There's a little bit of delay here. So the next question um, for Pete um, is, can you explain a little bit about your legal justification for in-kind services? Thanks, Malcolm. I can take this one. Um, in-kind services are, in fact, um, what we consider project enhancements to a project area. Uh, so it can be um, grading uh, the forest road that's um, alongside a, um, a forestry project. It's adding gates. Um, it's um, dealing with invasives, as we mentioned. Um, and these are all things that we consider um, en enhancements. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, so next question, I think this is a follow up to that previous question about um, invasive management control. And so I'm, I think this is in relation to or in regards to the use of uh, glyphosate. And so are those harmful to, to pollinators? Go to Tom. No, herbicides are specific to plants. Pesticides that are used that are, that could be harmful to pollinators would be something that um, like a neonicotinoid, which has um, has some effects on on insect life, but um, glyphosate does not affect the pollinators. And so, are you taking any specific steps here to sort of minimize the residual impacts or, or non-target impacts of of the use of that herbicide? Yeah, all herbicide contracts are done using low volume spray, so it's it's a very controlled application. Um, if there's like a bittersweet vine, then it's used by applying the chemical right to the severed stump or the severed vine. All right, so I think that we've got a comment here. Um, from Keith Fritz, uh, which is that thanking DCR for these presentations, and then basically a comment here that says sustainable forest man, forestry emulates natural forest disturbances to create much needed balance of tree ages, species, and habitat types. A broad range of species from wild turkeys to grouse and deer will benefit from the proposed practices. Uh, the proposed activities will create critical nesting, brood rearing, and foraging habitats. In turn, increased recreational benefits will be realized for hunters, wildlife watchers, and other recreational users as wildlife utilization of these areas increases. Um, NWTF Mass supports the proposed forestry projects to improve stand health and diversify forest structure, age class species composition on the specified state forests. All right, so we've still got some questions regarding uh, these invasive species management and the use of herbicides. And so um, a couple of questions here. So first is assuming that those um, herbicides affect the native species, native plant species, and they would also be potentially impacting um, the pollinators as well. Um, so uh, Chris, can you handle that one? Uh, sure, Malcolm. And, and actually, first, let me say I apologize that my uh, my computer locked me out of uh, being able to talk for a little while there. Thank you, Tom and, and Pete, for answering questions for me. So invasive species are definitely harmful to our native ecosystem, um, and we have to worry about not only invasive plants, but invasive insects as well, um, as is uh, usually a theme through many of our proposals, is, is really um, almost more of restoration projects uh, per se when when we're dealing with uh, with these things that have come in and are changing our native natural forests. So um, yes, invasive species are, are bad for the ecosystem and it, it has definitely an effect on the native species um, that are there. 
So dealing with uh, with the invasives, whether they be plants or insects, is is one of our high priorities. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, let's just see. Just want to give it one more minute for additional questions. Um, so I don't know if we've got any more questions in this um, session. So with that, I'll, I'll turn this back over to, to, to Tom to set up our, our last presentation of, of the evening. OK, well, thank you, Malcolm. Um, the last presentation for the evening is going to be made by Keith DiNardo. Keith's project is on the North, Northfield State Forest, and it's called the Burnham Road Project. So if you cue that up, thank you. Hello, my name is Keith DiNardo. I am the Eastern Connecticut Valley District Management Forester with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, Division of State Parks and Recreation. The Eastern Connecticut Valley District spans from about the edge of the Connecticut River east to the western edge of Worcester County and to the northern and southern state lines. Within my district is about 41,000 acres of DCR lands, including some of the notable state forests such as Warwick State Forest, Wendell State Forest, Irving State Forest, Northfield State Forest, Brimfield State Forest, and the Holyoke Range State Park. Here on this slide is a list of ecosystem services as they are defined in DCR's landscape designation management guidelines documents. Through active forest management, we strive to achieve and provide for some of, if not all, of the above listed ecosystem services. In addition, we have been in conversation with faculty from the Department of Environmental Conservation at UMass Amherst in regards to a possible collaboration with this project. Some tentative ideas discussed include implementing a collaborative study to investigate the relationships between forest management practices, forest structure and growth, and ways to enhance carbon stocks and flux, and eventually translating this research into outreach opportunities for forestry and natural resource professionals, as well as to members of the general public. This map shows the approximate location of DCR ownerships in the northern portion of the Eastern Connecticut Valley Management Forestry District, including portions of Warwick State Forest, Northfield State Forest, Irving State Forest, and Wendell State Forest. The dark green polygons you see here on this map are the approximate locations of these ownerships. As you can see, the majority of Northfield State Forest is located in the eastern portion of the town of Northfield along the Warwick line. Northfield State Forest is about 3,300 acres total, all of which is currently designated as a woodland. Now we'll zoom in to take a look at the Northfield Mount Hermon parcel, which was acquired by public land back in 2016. In total, DCR acquired just under 1,300 acres in the towns of Northfield and Warwick. Graydon Reservoir, which can be seen on the map located just north of the DCR property and just south of the state line, was not included in the acquisition along with several hundred acres surrounding the reservoir. This reservoir is still actively used as a public drinking su supply and is now owned and managed by a private entity. This parcel has a fairly rich history of active forest management. I was really only able to locate records that dated back to about eight, 1989, which included several forest cutting plans, as well as Chapter 61 forest stewardship plans. At least approximately 1,077 acres have been subject to some level of active management with uh, these acres are unique, meaning that some of the acreage may have been subject to multiple forest management projects over. Uh, now to zoom in a little bit and focus on uh, the Burnham Road project that we're talking about today that, that we're going over. Uh, the total project is going to encompass about 165 acres in total, and it's located between uh, Burnham Road and School Street in the southwestern corner of Herman parcel that is now owned by DCR. Uh, there has been some more recent forest management which occurred within this project area. Um, some of the more recent entries include in 1997, uh, 2005, 2010, and 2013, uh, that being the most recent just occurring uh, about eight years ago. Each of these entries occurred in slightly different locations across that uh, southwestern portion of the parcel. And their overall go goals varied from emergency salvage to selective thinning to crop tree release with group selection. This map here shows a little more detailed protect area. Um, like I said before, it's about 165 acres total. 
I currently have it delineated into four different stands, uh, white pine, white pine hardwoods, white pine hemlock, and hemlock hardwoods. Um, these stand delineations are based heavily on orthophotography interp interpretation. Um, they are subject to the lines as well as the species delineation is subject to change. I did do some walkthroughs, preliminary walkthroughs to field check some of my work. Um, but it's definitely not holding into a level where, where I need it to be to write a civil culture prescription. So this is all tentative planning. Um, a lot of this stuff will be adjusted as we, as we have an opportunity to get out in the field more and uh, better verify what's out there for stand compositions. This here shows the stand lines, uh, the approximate stand lines that you saw on the previous map, but they're overlaid on this one with the orthography that was used to interpret uh, some of the species composition and stand. So as you can see, this was done leaves off um, this photo, and there's a pretty stark difference between uh, deciduous and evergreen trees. And you can also make out some of the differentiation between white pine and eastern hemlock. Um, like I said previously, a lot of the current stand lines are drawn uh, based heavily on interpretation of these ortho photos, and they are subject to change as more information becomes prevalent. This slide shows a DEP wetland shapefile, which was last updated in 2013. During project layout and chapter 132 plan preparation phase of the project, field work will help determine if there are any additional wetland resources or sensitive areas. If additional resources are found, appropriate methodology will be applied to protect their integrity. This map here shows all the currently designated trails within the project area. Areas will be temporarily closed during active forest management operations. There are currently no plans to permanently close, reroute, or otherwise alter any of the designated trails. The DCR landscape designations management guidelines document states that aesthetic buffers should be applied to all designated trails. At this time, consideration is being given to waive some of the aesthetic buffers in order to better, better showcase some of the forest management strategies that are applied to DCR woodlands. This map shows the most recent iteration of the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Atlas from August of 2021. Uh, the hashed areas with it on the map, they indicate both primary habitat as well as estimated habitat. Um, as you can see, there are currently no implications to priority or estimated habitat within the proposed project area. This project, along with all forest management project proposed through DCR's management forestry program has been reviewed by habitat specialists within the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife and was subject to a preliminary review by the folks at the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. In addition to the previously listed ecosystem services provided by Woodlands on DCR property, here is a list of project goals I hope to attain with the implementation of this project. This includes increasing overall biodiversity, increasing structural diversity, improving forest productivity, and growth rates of residual trees, while also providing for an opportunity to possibly maintain and improve forest infrastructure within the state forest. All right, now I'd just like, like to discuss a little bit about the civil culture I hope to apply to the project area. Um, as of right now, I, I'm hoping to apply a variable density thinning with gaps across all stands. Um, I say this tentatively um, as there may be minor adjustments or changes to the silviculture applied to the site, uh, and these will be based on more information as it becomes available. Once I have the, uh, a time to plan and complete my uh, intensive forest inventory um, and have a better feel for what's actually on the site in terms of species composition and, and overall size classes, um, I'll be able to better hone in uh, exactly how the silviculture is going to be laid out on, on the ground. But this is just a uh, tentative discussion and, and planning for what I hope to achieve and, and how I hope to achieve it. And um, to talk a little bit about variable density thinning with gaps, you know, one of the ideas behind implementing this management regime is to ultimately create um, highly variable forest conditions within the project area. A small gaps, less than an acre in size, will be implemented throughout. And these gaps will be strategic, strategically placed with some considerations being slope aspects, current overstory condition and composition, as well as consideration for the current regeneration densities and species. Um, gaps, these gaps will not account for more than 20% of the total harvest area. And the areas outside of the gaps will be subject to a variable density thinning. 
Uh, this means that uh, basically the residual densities outside of these gaps will vary throughout the harvest area. Um, there will be a lot of things considered in terms of what densities will be left on site, uh, regeneration present, condition of the overstory, et cetera. Um, there, there will be a lot of variation. You know, Some areas, such as the gaps, will have minimal residual overstory trees present post-harvest, whereas other areas, uh, especially areas that are deemed more ecologically and environmentally sensitive, or areas that have a unique characteristic which would better be served by uh, not implementing active management at this time. They'll be set aside as patch reserves where, where we will not be entering with machinery and, with, and no trees will be cut or removed. Um, to talk about a little bit about this diagram and, and you know, to give an ex a little bit of an example, a visual perspective of what a variable density thinning with gaps may, may look like, um, I took this, this image from a U.S. Forester's public to variable density thinning using skips and gaps. Now, this is an illustration that shows an example of a variable density thinning which was implemented on a fairly uniform forest stand. As you can see on the left image, uh, this is a representation of a fairly uniform stand um, prior to any forest management being implemented on the site, whereas on the right, it's the same stand, just post-management uh, post activities. That is, uh, this is that same exact stand, but after uh, variable density thinning was applied. Now, as you can see in the image, there's a considerable amount of variation in the residual stand, with some areas being completely devoid of trees. You know, I expect these areas to be uh, similar in scope to the gaps that I hope to implement within the project area. Um, we do have minimal retention standards that are written out in the guidelines document. Um, so there will be some minimal retention within these patches, but, but we're going to try to keep it on the lighter side of things so just to uh, get, achieve the conditions that we're hoping to achieve. Um, where now, if you look on the, the lower uh, right and the upper left-hand corners of that uh, thinned stand there, you can see that these appear that no management has occurred, and they, they're relatively in the same state as they were prior to operations. Um, and these, you know, may have been sites that were deemed ecologically sensitive for whatever reason, and they were set aside as patch reserves, and, and there will be some of that within the total 165 project area. Uh, the end result of implementing a, a management like this is, to hopefully create a stand that exhibits a variety of growing conditions that will potentially favor the establishment of a wide array of overstory species, uh, as well as increasing variability as it pertains to the vertical and horizontal forest structure, and along with these diverse conditions becomes a more resilient forest overall. And just to briefly touch on, you know, post-harvest conditions uh, immediately after and, and, you know, possibly into the future, some future forest conditions. Um, as I mentioned, the goal of this project is to greatly diversify forest conditions to allow for increased biodiversity, along with increasing, you know, uh, higher level variability as it pertains to forest. Uh, conditions will vary from unmanaged forest to where there's nearly about 100% crown closure and minimal available sunlight on the forest floor to one acre openings where uh, there's virtually no overstory. You know, there will be minimal retention, as mentioned, but, you know, for the most part, it's going to be open, you know, and, and, we hope to achieve this more open growing conditions for a whole array of reasons, but mainly we hope that they'll be large enough and provide enough light to allow us in the establishment of some more shade and tolerant species, such as paper birch and aspen. <clears throat> Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, we have, well, we'll be establishing these patch reserves within the greater uh, project area. Um, you know, these will more focus on shade, you know, the regeneration of shade tolerant species and will provide better growing conditions and diverse conditions to allow for a broader spectrum of uh, hopefully regeneration, the establishment of a new cohort of trees. Um, so, you know, the areas between these two extremes of, of no cutting and implementing one acre openings, uh, they'll run the gamut, you know, and, and very uh, retention will vary. And, you know, we'll hopefully be able to uh, provide for an array of different conditions um, and it, it'll really look, you know, different in all different portions of the stand. Um, in areas where a desirable uh, advanced regeneration is present, uh, the regeneration will be, uh, as it's referred to as, released. You know, we hope to release this regeneration by uh, removing the overstory trees within close proximity while still protecting the existing regeneration to allow for increased light and resources, therefore ultimately increasing growth rates of the, of the existing trees. Um, residual overstory trees that remain on site, uh, areas that are thinned and, and individuals that are selected as legacy trees that will remain, they're expected to also increase their growth rates as 
the competition around their immediate vicinity will be reduced and more resources will become readily available for the remaining individuals. Uh, the overall appearance of the site will range across different portions of the stand. Some areas where gaps are implemented, you know, they'll appear dramatically different from what they did, you know, in their prior condition. Whereas there will be some areas left untreated as patch reserves and, you know, they'll ultimately look identical to what they do now. And, and natural forest processes will take place into the future and, you know, you could expect some uh, natural change over time. But for the most part, after post-harvest or post-management, uh, they'll be, you know, intact as they are now. Overall, it is, it is expected that this forest will exhibit higher levels of biodiversity across uh, understory and overstory species of vegetation alike. And it will also increase structural diversity in the years to come. And hopefully as we move forward in time, we can continue to implement, you know, uh, well thought out forest management strategies to uh, further diversify forest conditions and, and hopefully achieve more resilient forests overall in a, in, in a larger picture of DCR uh, ownerships. And I just wanted to, that's pretty much all I have for this project. I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to discuss the project at hand. Um, I'll be available uh, immediately after this presentation or whenever it's decided to answer a handful of questions as time allows. Um, otherwise, feel free to submit your comments to the, uh, the, the address that was provided earlier in the presentations and uh, I look forward to, to hearing some comments and uh, to some questions. And again, I appreciate you taking the time to take an interest in the management that is hopefully going to be applied on some of our state forest lands. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Keith, uh, for that nice presentation. Um, and so I uh, will start the Q&A session for this project for folks who may have uh, joined during the during the portion of that presentation. Uh, we're talking about a proposed project uh, within the Northfield State Forest um, that's referred to as the Burnham Road uh, Project or project, uh, yeah, excuse me, Burnham Road Project. And so our first question on this uh, proposed project was actually posed earlier um, in our presentations this evening. And so um, basically it was a question regarding the, the map that's associated with that proposal. And so that map shows a rather large um, tract of land that's proposed to be treated. And essentially, they're wondering what the, the harvest prescription is for that area. So I know that was a, a lot of that was already in the presentation that you had, but maybe just reiterate what your, your plans are for that overall area. Keith. Right. So, yeah, uh, generally uh, what I hope to apply is a variable density thinning with gaps. And that basically is a, is a system which will, you know, as it is well spelled out, uh, we'll be thinning areas to variable retention uh, overall the entire overall through the entire project area, as well as implementing up to one acre gaps uh, that will not encompass more than 20% of the total forest area. Um, these gaps are hopefully going to be established uh, in pro close proximity to existing openings that were made through previous forest management, uh, as well as uh, you know a lot of considers a lot of different. Uh, things will be in, taken into consideration when when laying out these gaps in the field. So that's a, a rough overview. Um, keep your eyes peeled for the, the silviculture prescription. There'll be a, a, a wealth of information pertaining to uh, what's currently out there uh, for inventory, as well as uh, a mu much more detailed uh, depiction of the silviculture that we, will be applied across the uh, total 165 acres. And just a quick note on that 165 acres, um, I, I anticipate that that number will will decrease as we get further into the project, just by eliminating areas that have been designated as patch reserves, uh, areas that are more ecologically or envi environmentally sensitive, as well as um, you know uh, applying filters and filter strips and, and buffers around uh, wetland resources. So uh, that that's a to answer that question. That's pretty much what I have. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, so our next question um, is for, for Pete, um, and it's sort of on a, on a more general level. Uh, so are forestry cutting plans available to Northfield Conservation Commission and the Open Space Committee? Thanks, Malcolm. So um, forest cutting plans do um, go to the Town Conservation Commission at, at the end of the process. One of the things I wanted to mention, um, we've changed our public process about three years ago uh, we now um, send letters to select boards um, early on in the process. So back in July, uh, we sent um, <coughs> letters to each town um, asking if they wanted to have us come to present this um, particular proposal uh, to their town. So um, 
So it's one extra step within the public process um, that we want um, people to be aware of. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, so now we have a, another question that's specific to this project. So Keith, how will you uh, be protecting the, the trails that are within this area? We lost Keith. He, he's got his, his off. All right, so it sounds like we may have lost Keith here. Oh, so, my mistake uh, there, I, I'm back on. Sorry about that, okay. folks. Uh, yeah, yeah, so pertaining, pertaining to the trails and how they'll be protected. So per our uh, guidelines document, the management guidelines document uh, for DCR uh, designated uh, properties, um, we do, we are going to be hopefully, uh, I mean, we, we do you know, generally apply aesthetic buffers in and around recreational trails. Um, I'm hoping to have some extensive conversations with our trails coordinator, our trails team with DCR, as well as our operations staff to hopefully waive some of these aesthetic buffers in some uh, specific locations within the project area, hopefully to better highlight and, and uh, spotlight some of the forest management that we apply to DCR uh, woodlands. And this, you know, will hopefully transfer into um, a future outreach and educational opportunities within the forest area. But for the most part, you know, we, we'll try to minimize um, skidding and forwarding across our, or, or along skid, uh, designated trails, uh, tr cross the trails at a 90 degree angle and, you know, implement buffers where, where we feel it it is uh, necessary. So um, all the trails that are currently designated uh, by DCR as official DCR trails uh, will be treated, you know, uh, as designated trails and we'll try our best to protect them, uh, you know, falling trees away from the trails, uh, clearing slash and stuff out of the corridor, the trail corridors. Um, I will say that portions of the state forest will be temporarily closed during active forest management uh, just as a safety precaution. So uh, keep your eyes open for signs being posted on the landings and, and at the trailheads to indicate uh, when different portions of the state forest will be uh, temporarily closed. I hope that answers your question. All right, thanks, Keith. Uh, so the next question also specific to this project. Um, why are you proposing management in this area, uh, given that it's been logged four times in the past 25 years? All uh, right, so some of those, as I said, those uh, last four management projects that were uh, implemented across this project area, they all varied uh, in location and size. Uh, some were quite small. There was a uh, white pine, uh, emergency salvage operation that occurred, I believe it was 2008. I can't remember the exact year on that. Um, that just, you know, did a little bit of uh, removal pertaining to some 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 blowdown and storm related damage. Um, the previous forester implemented a series of uh, group openings and as well as some thinning in between. So the idea here is to continue on with some of the management that was previously prescribed and implemented within the landscape. Uh, within the project area, and that is, you know, diversifying forest conditions, as well as hopefully establishing a new cohort of trees and uh, diversifying overall uh, overstory species within the project area. So um, that's that's pretty much all I have. All right. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so um, again, another question uh, coming in specific to this project. Uh, so Keith, I'll field this or send this one to you. So what will be the, what's the proposed buffer behind the Burnham Road houses as part of this project? Uh, legally, DCR is not obligated or any force operation is not obligated to implement aesthetic buffers along uh, private property lines, uh, along public roadways. You know, we have to adhere to 50 foot, 50% 50 basal area retention. Uh, and if it's a scenic road, we have to adhere to a 100 foot, 50% uh, basal area retention post harvest. Um, I uh, what, doing just a brief walkthrough. I anticipate. I mean, j if I remember correctly, I, I believe it's a little bit low and a little bit wet on that portion of the project area that abuts those uh, houses along Burnham Road. I I can't say you know 100% that we will be implementing buffers. I don't anticipate putting any uh, uh, larger openings like one acre openings within very close proximity. So I, I wouldn't expect to see, you know, uh, an opening right in your backyard, but you know, you could see some individual tree selection and removal uh, within pretty close proximity to the boundary. And I, I generally make it a point not to remove trees directly on the boundary or very, very close to the boundary just uh, because I'm not a licensed land surveyor and sometimes determining those lines can be challenging. So uh, there you go. 
the other. All right, thanks, Keith. Uh, so we've got a, a general question here, uh, sort of related to DCR's management priorities uh, as it relates to forest carbon. Uh, so Tom, I'll send this question to you. And so um, the question is, are, are your woodland zone goals listed in terms of priority? Uh, what is the most important goal at this time for DCR? And in particular, why is uh, carbon stock management listed last in those priorities given the preeminent threat of climate change in the short window for mitigation? Well, we don't specifically look at carbon stocks as a result of climate change. So I would refer you to our website on how we manage for carbon and the priorities that we take. Okay, um, thanks, Tom. And so um, this is sort of a, a follow-up. It's it's related question. So um, it's more of a statement here, but so forest cutting uh, or timber timber harvesting releases carbon. Um, it will take many, many years for that carbon to be stored again. Um, so would someone, maybe maybe Tom or, or Pete, provide some information where folks can find some information or refer folks to, to online information, DCR publications, so forth, uh, that relate to your, your forest carbon management strategy. So I know you mentioned something, Tom, on the website, but is there sp some specific links that we can share within the Q&A for folks to be able to access? Yes, on, on my presentation, I listed several links to some good information on carbon. One of them refers to our webpage on how we manage um, carbon stocks. Malcolm, if I if I could also jump in. Um, one of the things one of the things that we do um, across um, our state is we measure a carbon on a landscape scale. Uh, through our continuous forest inventory monitoring system, we have 2000 plots across the state and uh, we've been inventorying um, forest data on those plots for over 60 years. Um, that Managing for uh, Carbon website um, talks a lot about the CFI system and how we measure carbon across the Commonwealth and I encourage people to look at that. Okay, thanks Pete um, and also Tom. Uh, so our next question is going back a little bit to um, related to our earlier question about um, protection for trails. And so we have a question um, which is there's three trails that are in that proposed project area or proposed uh, within a map in the proposed project of the excuse me, yeah, the map of the proposed project area. Um, but not all of them are official trails or designated as official trails on the map. And so uh, Keith, are you uh, planning to apply any aesthetic buffers along those trails? Um, so in terms of the trails that are not on the map, um, I'm going to have to refer to our uh, trails coordinator and our trails program within the agency. Um, my understanding is that I was given the latest iteration of designated DCR designated trails, and that's what I showed up on that uh, map there earlier in my presentation. Um, uh, it was my understanding that there were several uh, miles of trails that were closed as a as an effort through by DCR to try to not only um, clear up some of the confusion and and some of the hectic uh, mapping involved with some of those trails that were out there, but also to bring the trail densities more within the uh, woodlands designation uh, guidelines as well as into following our guidelines that are written in the trails uh, DCR trails guidelines and and best management practices document. So. Um, I'll have some conversations with our operations and trail staff, but I, as of right now, if the trail is not currently designated as a official DCR trail, no protection will be applied to those trails. Okay, thanks, Keith. Uh, and so um, again, sort of another question specific to this project, but relating to the broader uh, DCR management goals. And so, uh, given that increasing biodiversity is is one of the stated goals for the for this Burnham Road project. Uh, what is the, the baseline biological inventory that you're using um, within this proposed area? And how are the taxa that are being monitored selected? Uh, so, you know, we, we generally do a, a pretty standard uh, forest inventory. Uh, for the most part, uh, this entails a pretty intensive survey of the overstory. Uh, we don't go out and measure every single tree and every single plant, but we will do uh, statistical sampling. Um, I haven't quite figured out exactly how I'm going to how I'm going to line up my survey, uh, my my overstory 
my overstore inventory just yet. Uh, I do hope to have conversations with UMass to hopefully integrate some possible additional uh, information to, to um to record uh, during the inventory phase that we could hopefully move forward into into the collaboration of, of future research. But generally, for the most part, we do an overstory, an overstory sample at each plot. Uh, we also do a regeneration sample uh, that includes herbaceous as well as uh, tree species. Um, if I see something, I, I have a pretty good uh, a pretty good eye for identifying plants. If I see something that I don't recognize, I, I will make an effort to I key it out and identify it. Um, and then we also at most plots, or I, I'm going to say every plot, I will also be implementing a coarse woody debris transect just to get an estimate of the total coarse woody debris present on the site at this time. Um, so that's pretty much a, a rough, a really quick overview of how I intend on doing an inventory sample. Um, I usually in my civil culture prescriptions will write out a very detailed uh, synopsis of exactly what I was measuring the different size classes for the regeneration species, as well as um, the coarse weighted degree transects uh, lengths and, and how you know the, they were determined uh, in terms of direction from the plot center. So uh, that's just an overview and, and feel like I said, keep your eyes peeled to the for the uh, civil culture prescription. It has a lot of information pertinent to that to that question. Okay, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, so we've got a question um, it relates back to an earlier question as well uh, for Pete on a general level uh, regarding the the 45 day public comment period. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about um, that public the length of that public comment period, given that uh, folks are just getting information about these uh, proposed projects uh, today? Uh, why is the deadline of August 31st? Two minutes to go. Um, Thanks, Malcolm. Um, as I mentioned, um, we've uh, we've had these projects posted since July. Um, we do have a deadline of the 31st, but we will accept comments beyond that. So um, if people um, send comments, we do accept them. OK, thanks, Pete. Uh, so one additional question here specific to to the Burnham Road project. Um, in the last round of logging within within the Northfield State Forest, um, there was harvest that went across the trails, uh, creating light gaps. Um, these trails have grown in are difficult to traverse due to the vegetation, uh, ticks, etc. Uh, so, will there be um, will the state will DCR clear these trails in the coming years? Uh, in terms of uh, cutting regeneration for trails, um, I think it should be done. You know, within a small. Uh, buffer along the trails, like you said, to allow for uh, less brush creeping in and, and hitting you in the face as you're walking. Um, unfortunately, I am not responsible for the upkeep of these trails. Uh, that would fall into the uh, operations staff. And I know that there ha there are some volunteer efforts in some of the state parks where, where volunteers come in and assist with some of that uh, trail maintenance work. I can't speak directly to it. Um, I, I I'm sure that you know there an effort will be taken. I, I know that our trail staff has been pretty diligent in you know uh, getting the Student Conservation Association out on site over the past few years to do a bunch of trail work, including clearing back some trails, uh, reblazing, closing, and relocating some trails where there are problem areas. So um, I wish I could provide more information on on how exactly the future uh, trail maintenance is going to occur, but uh, as of right now, I, I really can't speak too much to that. Uh, so one follow up question, uh, Keith, for you regarding you mentioned earlier that you would reach out to UMass. So how specifically are you planning to, to work with UMass on, on this proposed project? So I'm hoping to have some conversations with staff at the at the UMass uh, Amherst College um, pre inventory when I'm setting up my inventory to establish some some goals of what we hope to achieve overall. And if that requires, you know, uh, doing a more intensive sample uh, within our, you know, inventory process for the project area. Uh, so be it. You know, if, if you know we decide that we're going to do a, a more in-depth study for uh, duff depth, or you know, increase our coarse woody debris sample to better estimate carbon stocks that are currently on the landscape, I, I'm I'm totally willing to ideas and and options. You know, in terms of increasing what we sample for. And uh, like I said, I hope to have a lot of conversations with the UMass staff moving forward as we get to our inventory phase, and then as we get to the prescription writing as well as implementation of the of the civil culture that's applied. So, uh, just a lot of conversations. Hopefully, we'll have good coordination and, and uh, collaboration with with the with UMass moving forward. Okay, thank you, Keith. Uh, so, just a quick um, 
just read a comment here to be entered into the public record, which is uh, Mount Grace Land Tr or excuse me, Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust supports the proposed project at Northfield State Forest. Uh, and so then we'll move on to our next question here, which is uh, related again to to forest carbon management. And so um, since forest carbon, excuse me, since forest management removes carbon from the forest, how can it also increase carbon capture and storage, especially in the short term, uh, which is of critical importance in meeting the climate emergency already underway? Uh, so Tom, can you can you uh, address that question? Sure. Carbon can be stored in two ways, one in live trees and second in forest products. And also when we do thinnings and group openings, we are also releasing younger, healthier trees, which have a greater capacity to sequester more carbon. That's the second thing we look, look into. And again, I'll refer to our, our website where people can find the information on how we store or how we manage our carbon stocks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so a sort of a general question that I'll put forward to either to either Tom or to Pete, um, which is how many towns follow up on having um, presentations, I suppose, specific to these uh, proposed projects? I can answer that, Malcolm. Um, so since we've been sending out information to select boards in part of our public process over the last few years, about half of the towns take us up on um, having us join uh, one of their select board meetings. Um, uh, this year, um, at this point in time, we've had six proposals and two um, communities asked us to uh, attend their meetings. OK, uh, so thank you, Pete. So we're a little bit over time already. Um, do we have time to field these remaining questions, Dan, or should we do we need to move on to the out? OK, so let's try to wrap up with these last few questions uh, and then we'll wrap things up for the evening. Uh, OK, so. Uh, just find myself here. Um, OK, so Keith, when do you when do you actually anticipate that this project, if it were if it were accepted, when it would actually begin? Would it be this winter or would it be in some time in the future? I would say um, this is kind of a challenging question to answer. Um, I would say that I wouldn't expect anything to happen within a year. Um, generally, after everything is done, the contract is drafted, uh, the cutting plan is filed and approved, and we have a, a successful bidder for the project. Um, the contract usually lasts for two years along with the forest cutting plan, and there is available room for extension. So once the project is sold and ready to go, there is room for the project to be extended uh, going into the future. So I would say anywhere between one year and four years. Um, and you know, total project, depending on the operation that gets out there, you know, if it's a, a hand feller with a forwarder, uh, you know, that could take a, a lot longer than a mecha mechanized uh, cut to length machine with a forwarder or a couple skidders. So uh, it's variable. I wouldn't expect it to take more than one season personally, but uh, it all depends on, you know, the total silviculture, uh, how everything is laid out, and and the total equipment mix that that we expect on the site. So that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so uh, uh, an additional question here, which is, uh, where are you planning to do any kind of invasive species management or monitoring uh, post harvest within this area? Yeah, so there were some uh, invasive species identified uh, along Burnham Road. Uh, I noticed just in my preliminary walkthroughs, uh, at least um, uh, glossy buckthorn, oriental bittersweet. I did notice a couple Japanese barberry plants. I only saw two of those and I pulled them up, but I, I assume there are more out there. Um, we do have a monitoring protocol in place post harvest. So at the five year mark after a harvest on all of our forest management projects, we go out and do a regeneration and um, a regeneration and invasive species uh, survey. So we set up uh, different uh, sampling techniques in different uh, areas that have been managed differently. And we do a uh, overall inventory of what's out there. I do intend on implementing some sort of uh, invasive management treatments along Burnham Road. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to approach that just yet. I'm hoping to have some discussions with our ecology program, uh, as well as reaching out to some um, uh, invasive specialists within the area to discuss best approaches to to uh, poss possibly managing get get some of these populations under control. I know the most popular and easiest and cost effective route, as Tom mentioned, is uh, you know foliar foliar applications uh, late summer. So that may be on the table. I'm I'm definitely not going to weigh it out, but uh, more information will become available as we move forward. 
Okay, thank you, Keith. I know there's a few questions that we, we didn't get to, but in the interest of time, we're gonna move forward um, and I'll turn things over to, to Pete to take this out uh, for the evening. And I'll just remind folks that we will be having another round of presentations uh, on Thursday evening, again, from, from 4.30, uh, from 4.30 to, excuse me, from 4 to 5.30. Uh, so if you didn't have your questions answered and you'd like to, to sign on to those and ask them there, that's, that's also a possibility. Uh, but with that, I'll turn things over to, to Pete to, to sort of um, wrap things up for the evening. Great, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm, for uh, helping us out here with the Q&A. Um, and thank you everybody that attended. Um, uh, this is important to us. Um, uh, there was a lot of good um, feedback, um, some really good questions. Um, any questions that we did not get to, we will be answering. Um, we will be putting it up on our website. So, um, so if we didn't get to your question, we will. And again, we will be um, having um, the other part of the public meeting on Thursday for the other three projects. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much for attending.